Hello, and welcome to the Jamar family of companies. I'm Jacob Tornquist, president of the Jamar Company. You are now joining a company that has been around over 100 years. We are a solution-focused specialty services contractor with a regional presence and national reach. We deliver industry-leading value, dependability, and field leadership. We live each day by our mission, vision, and values. Our mission, to be the best, to be the leader, resonates with all our team members when they show up each day. Our vision starts with the health and safety of our people first. That is the most important thing we can do each day. As our employee operating code states, we work safely and always look out for each other. This is at the core of our company. We live by our values and they guide our decisions. At the center of our values is our people and our customers. Our people and the relationships they build and the work they accomplish together make us special. Our customers expect the best from us. Quality, craftsmanship, creative solutions, and above all else, performing our work safely. We help build our customers' dreams each and every day. Safety is at the forefront when we show up each day. We will support you and get you the resources you need to get the work done safely each day and go home to your families at night. I want you to know everyone has authority and responsibility to stop work if you don't feel something is right. Go see your supervisor, ask questions, make sure you understand what you are doing before you complete your task. We need your leadership and your best every day. Again, welcome. We are glad you are on the team. Welcome to Jamar Safety Orientation. This orientation will provide an overview of Jamar policies and procedures. This information can also be found in greater detail in the Jamar Safety Handbook. As a Jamar employee, you are responsible for complying with all of the company policies contained in the Jamar Employee Safety Handbook, as well as any site or project specific rule or policies. If you have any questions or need clarification on any of these policies or any of the information contained in this safety orientation, please refer to your handbook or ask your supervisor. Jamar believes that working with zero injuries is not only achievable, but also expected. Our goal is simple, zero injuries every day. We want every employee to understand they are empowered, responsible, and expected to correct hazards in their work area. Each and every employee plays a role in helping us achieve our daily goal of zero injuries. Do not take direction from a client or vendor unless you have been instructed to do so by your supervisor. Any change in your employment records needs to be communicated with the company. Any employee absent from the job for two consecutive days without notification will be considered a voluntary quit. Possession of firearms, ammunitions, or weapons of any kind is not allowed on client or company property. Employees are expected to report to work fit for duty. Employees unfit for duty shall communicate to the supervisor any concerns they may have with respect to them completing the assigned work tasks in a safe manner. If an employee shows up late for work or otherwise misses the work instruction and the JSA process, they are to immediately report to the supervisor for instruction and review and sign the JSA. Employees are not allowed to take pictures and or video of client's property without permission from your supervisor and the client. In the event of an emergency, all employees shall follow the site-specific emergency and evacuation procedures. Employees must not leave the job site during working hours without notifying their supervisor. Falsifying records, reports, information, or engaging in other purposeful acts to misrepresent an injury, accident, property damage, etc. is prohibited. Do not enter unauthorized areas without permission from your supervisor. Disruption of work progress with activities including but not limited to fighting, horseplay, physical altercations, or intentional slowdowns will not be tolerated. Smoking is allowed in designated areas only. It is expected that you be in your assigned work area at the start time and take breaks at established times, knowingly or willingly circumventing safety devices, policies, or procedures will not be tolerated. Employees must not remove company, client, or other property without permission. The destruction, damage, or misplacement of tools, materials, or equipment through careless or willful acts is prohibited. 
If you need to use your cell phone outside of the scheduled break times, you must get permission to do so from your supervisor. Jamar is committed to the safety and security of its employees and customers. If you receive any threats, are the subject of or witness any threatening behavior, acts of violence, verbal or physical harassment, or other actions, please report these to your supervisor immediately. Jamar is committed to providing a work environment free of discrimination. It is the policy of Jamar to not tolerate discriminatory acts. Jamar's complete affirmative action plan is located at the corporate and satellite offices and is available for viewing upon request. The company has made a commitment to its employees and customers that it will provide and maintain a drug and alcohol free work environment. The use of drugs or alcohol in company and affiliate workplaces poses a serious threat to the safety of our employees, compromises the quality and reliability of the products and services we owe our customers, and jeopardizes the protection of property owned by the company, our customers, and other companies. Whether you're an applicant for a work assignment or a current employee, as a condition of employment, you voluntarily consent to provide a specimen for drug and alcohol testing and searches to be conducted by personnel contracted to perform these services for Jamar. Your work assignment is contingent upon your acceptance of this program and furthermore is a condition of your continued employment with Jamar. The daily pre-task meeting, or JSA, is in place to identify hazards that you will encounter during the course of your work. Precautions and procedures that must be followed will be communicated through the JSA process. Employees are expected to actively participate in all safety meetings and express any safety concerns or questions to their supervisor. Jamar Disciplinary Action Policy has been developed and implemented for those employees who knowingly, willingly, or repeatedly violate policies and or rules. A summary of this policy can be found in your handbook. Based on the severity of a violation or misconduct, any employee may be terminated from employment on a first offense. In addition to injuries, all property damage and near-miss incidents must be reported immediately to your supervisor. Reporting incidents in a timely manner is critical to helping us maintain a safe work environment. Whether it be a near-miss, property damage, or an injury, it is our mission to learn from these incidents and respond accordingly. Reporting incidents today will help us prevent injuries tomorrow. All injuries must be immediately reported to your supervisor. We want to ensure you receive the appropriate treatment and we want to identify opportunities to prevent similar injuries from occurring in the future. Failure to report injuries immediately to your supervisor may result in disciplinary action. If you are injured outside of work and or have been treated by a medical professional for a non-work related injury or illness that limits your ability to perform the essential functions of your job and assigned work tasks, you must notify your supervisor. You may be required to provide documentation from your treating medical professional indicating what, if any, restrictions you may have. A near miss is an unplanned event or incident where if circumstances were a little different, it could have resulted in an injury, property damage, or other loss. We need these reported so we can learn from these events and implement protective measures to prevent an actual injury or loss from occurring in the future. We strongly encourage employees to report all near misses to their supervisor. Similar to near misses, we want to learn from these incidents so we can prevent injuries and or additional losses from occurring in the future. Damaged property may require repair or replacement and can lead to an unsafe condition. This is why it's critical that you inform your supervisor. Report all incidents resulting in property damage immediately to your supervisor. Jamar has three zero tolerance policies referred to as our cardinal rules. They are lockout tagout, confined space entry procedures, and fall protection. Violation of a cardinal rule will result in a minimum five-day suspension and may lead up to and include termination. Reason being is that an incident resulting from an issue related to one of these areas is usually serious, including significant debilitating injury or possibly loss of life. Lock or tag out protects employees by preventing the accidental startup of equipment or the release of stored energy. Site-specific lock or tag out procedures must be followed at all times. Follow the direction of the host company. Always verify that you are locking out on the correct location and lockbox. No employee shall remove another employee's lock or tag. Do not leave the key in your lock when it is placed on a lockbox or other isolating device. The key has to remain under your control. Employees must remove their lock when they leave the job site unless instructed otherwise. 
Do not use your lockout lock for purposes other than lockout. Be sure to lock out the appropriate hole of the hasp when using a gang or spider hasp. If you are the last one to lock out on a hasp, add another hasp to allow others to lock out as well. Bypassing or compromising the integrity of lockout tagout in any way will not be tolerated. If you lose the key for your lock and you're locked out on a lockbox or energy isolation device, notify your supervisor immediately. Personal ID tags attached to your lockout lock at a minimum must contain the name of the employee and the company name. Before removing your lock, ensure all tools and materials are cleared away from the equipment that is being unlocked and to reinstall any guards that were removed prior to work being performed. Confined space entry procedures have been established to protect workers who enter into confined spaces. A confined space, by definition, is large enough and so configured that an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work. It has limited or restricted means for entry or exit, and it is not designed for continuous human occupancy. Examples of confined spaces include tanks, vessels, silos, storage bins, hoppers, vaults, and pits. There are two types of confined spaces permit required and non-permit required. A permit required confined space has one or more of the following characteristics. Contains or has a potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Contains a material that has the potential for engulfing an entrant. Has an internal configuration such that an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or by a floor which slopes downward and tapers to a smaller cross section or contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazards. All site-specific confined space entry procedures must be followed. Prior to removing access covers or opening access doors, verify all potential hazards or energy sources have been isolated. If a cover or access door is removed, the opening must be adequately guarded to prevent a person, or debris in some cases, from falling into the space. Only trained and authorized employees may enter into a confined space. Only designated and qualified rescue personnel may enter a confined space for rescue purposes. If while working inside a confined space in the whole watch orders an evacuation, all entrants must immediately evacuate the space. Unless deemed non-permit required, no employee can enter a confined space without a completed confined space entry permit in place and posted at the entry of the confined space. Prior to initial entry inside a permit required confined space, a pre-entry meeting will be performed by the entry supervisor. Where applicable, the pre-entry meeting will include a review of the following information, atmospheric monitoring results, hazards present inside the space, PPE requirements, lockout location, special instructions, emergency procedures. Here is an example of what our confined space entry permit looks like. The requirements for entry, which were reviewed in the pre-entry meeting, can be found in the upper portion of the permit. The entry supervisor will test the atmosphere to verify it is safe for entry. The pre-entry atmospheric monitoring results can be found in the lower portion of our confined space entry permit. It is company policy that all employees shall be tied off 100% or protected by other means when working at height greater than 6 feet. Some job sites require fall protection to be used at heights lower than 6 feet. In those cases, the job site specific height will be enforced. The specific components can vary, but a personal fall arrest system consists of the following. Full body harness, an anchorage connector, and a connecting device. A full body harness must be worn with the rear D-ring positioned between the shoulder blades. The chest strap should be positioned across the center of the chest and the leg strap should be adjusted so they are snug to the groin area. A good rule of thumb is to position the leg strap so that you can comfortably slide or fit your hand between your leg and the leg strap. Harnesses must be inspected for damage and adjusted for proper fit prior to each use. While inspecting your harness, look for cuts, burns, tears, abrasions, torn stitching and damage to buckles, D-rings, and other hardware. Any damaged or defective harnesses must be removed from service immediately. There are several different types of anchorage connectors. The two most common are referred to as beamers and D-ring straps, or chokers. Beamers are designed to clamp onto a structural I-beams, while D-ring chokers are designed to wrap around an anchorage point. Anchorage points must be rigid and capable of supporting 5,000 pounds. 
Where sharp edges may come into contact with a D-ring choker, place a softener between an anchorage point and the D-ring choker. Make sure they are used correctly. Look close when using a synthetic D-ring beam strap. The wide part of the strap is the abrasion resistant material and needs to be the part touching the beam. In addition, if you need to make the strap shorter, you can continue to wrap it around the beam. But each wrap needs to be directly on top of the first pass and goes through the larger D-ring on each wrap. Wire rope steel chokers, nylon slings, shackles, or any other equipment designed and used specifically for lifting or rigging operations must not be used in a personal fall arrest system. The third component of a personal fall arrest system is a connecting device. The two most common connecting devices are shock absorbing lanyards and self retracting lifelines, otherwise known as SRLs, a retractable, or a yo yo. Shock absorbing lanyards are typically six foot in length and will stretch up to an additional three and a half feet in the event of a fall. As a rule of thumb, shock absorbing lanyards should only be used in situations where workers are exposed to a fall greater than 18 and a half feet. Retractables have a built-in braking system that significantly reduces the distance a worker free falls before engaging. As a result, retractables should be used in lieu of shock absorbing lanyards when exposed to a fall less than 18 and a half feet. The reduced free fall distance experienced when using a retractable will also result in less force being placed on the body in the event of a fall. This slide illustrates the importance of allowing 18 and a half feet of clearance when using a shock absorbing lanyard. The distance accounts for the height of the worker, the total length of a deployed lanyard, and a three foot clearance for safety factor from the lower elevation. The snap hook from the SRL must be connected directly to the rear D-ring of a full body harness or to an extension lanyard. 18 inch extension lanyards make it possible to connect oneself to the rear D-ring without assistance. An extension lanyard is only allowed to be used with an SRL. It cannot be used to increase the length of a six-foot shock-absorbing lanyard. A shock-absorbing lanyard and a self-retracting lifeline can never be used together in the same system. Snap hooks must be connected directly to the D-ring of a full-body harness or anchorage connector. Never connect a snap hook directly to another snap hook. We are continually striving for ways to prevent injuries and make our job site safer. Year after year, over 75% of our injuries on our projects fall into one of these four categories. Eye injuries, hand injuries, injuries resulting from grinders, injuries resulting from manual material handling. As a result of this finding, Jamar places great emphasis on the following four areas. Safety glasses with side shields are required to be worn at all times. That is what we wear when we do not expect any hazards. Face shields must be worn when we are creating flying particles or near someone else that is creating flying particles, solid or liquid, or when a kickback of a tool is possible. Your hands are your livelihood. You do your whole job with your hands, so protect them. Gloves are required to be worn at all times, and they must be the appropriate gloves for the task. Whether it be for protection from cuts and lacerations, chemicals, or welding and hot work as well as protecting from cold weather along with providing cut resistance. A good rule of thumb, no pun intended, is to never blindly place your hands anywhere. Always look to where you intend to place your hand. To prevent injuries resulting from the use of handheld grinders, the following safe work practices are required. Guards and handles must be in place at all times. If the handle must be removed to complete a task, you must obtain your supervisor's permission before removing the handle and it must immediately be reinstalled when the job is complete. Two hands required on the grinder. Even if you have permission to remove the handle, two hands are still required on the grinder. So plan on using a vise or having a coworker hold the material. Face shields must be worn at all times, regardless of the type of wheel being used or the material being worked on. Grinders are not allowed to have locking switch triggers. We have all heard the saying, work smarter, not harder. Take care of your body. It's the only one you have. 50 pounds is the maximum weight for a single person left. Use mechanical equipment or get help from coworkers whenever a load weighs more than 50 pounds and or is too bulky to lift or carry safely by yourself. Whenever team lifting with two or more people, always ensure that you maintain clear communication. Plan your path, maintain a clear view and pathway while moving material. If using mechanical means such as a cart, pallet jack, 
four-wheel cart, bottle cart, etc. Be sure the material is secure from movement. Prior to cutting metal banding, take precautions to protect yourself and others from the springing force of the banding. Plan your lift before you begin. Determine how to grip, clear path to follow, and how to safely set it down. To avoid pinched fingers, use dunnage or cribbing when setting down material. At a minimum, the following PPE is required to be worn by all employees unless specified otherwise. A hard hat. Safety glasses with side shields. Prescription glasses must be ANSI approved and must have side shields. Safety toed boots. Shirts with sleeves. Full length pants. Gloves that are appropriate for the task. Depending on the task in which you are assigned and or the job site requirements, there may be additional PPE required to be worn. For example, high visibility vests, Tyvek or chemical suits, thermal boots while working around hot fly ash, hearing protection, face shields, and respirators. These additional requirements will be communicated to you by your supervisor. Do not wear loose or baggy clothing around rotating tools or equipment. If wearing a hooded sweatshirt, ensure the strings are tucked in, removed, or otherwise secured to prevent being caught in rotating tools or equipment. OSHA requires the use of face shields when workers are exposed to flying objects, molten metal, liquid chemicals, acids or caustics, chemical gases or vapors, or potentially hazardous light radiation. Safety glasses alone cannot always protect us from flying particles and do nothing to protect the rest of our face. Face shields are required to be worn when performing the following tasks. Using a bench grinder, jackhammering or chipping, milling or prepping boiler tubes or pipe overhead, concrete sawing or cutting, needle gunning, torching, burning or other cutting, grinding, cutting or buffing with a handheld grinder. Remember, safety glasses still need to be worn under your face shield. Ideally, we create an environment free of contaminants. When we cannot reduce the contaminants below the permissible exposure limit, respiratory protection will be required. If deemed required, you will be fit tested and must be medically cleared to wear the respirator. If a respirator is not required to be worn, but you want to wear one to provide an extra layer of protection and comfort, you need to make sure your respirator doesn't create a hazard. It must be kept clean and stored properly. For more information, please refer to your handbook. The effects of short-term and long-term exposure to noise may produce hearing loss if you fail to wear proper hearing protection. Hearing protection shall be worn by all employees exposed to 85 decibels or more over an 8-hour time-weighted average. Tasks that require hearing protection include, but are not limited to, operating or working around mobile equipment, grinding, air arcing, cutting, and jackhammering. Hearing protection will be provided to you. Never bypass, alter, or remove any installed safety device. Tools must be used in the way they were designed by the manufacturer. Modifications are prohibited, such as using cheaters on wrenches. Use the right tool for the job. Do not throw tools from one level to another. Use a lifting aid, like a lifting bag or bucket. Do not lift or carry power tools by the power cord. Before energizing any power tool, verify that the power switch is in the off position. We need to take steps to safeguard against the tool from energizing while our hands are in harm's way. Always unplug the power tool or remove the battery before changing out bits, wheels, discs, or blades. Power tools must be plugged into a ground fault circuit interrupter. No employee is allowed to operate a powder actuated tool unless authorized to do so. Damaged or defective tools shall be red tagged and taken out of service immediately. Power tools must be equipped with a three-prong type grounded connection, or they must be double insulated. Two hands are required on the porta van. Set up a vise or have a co-worker hold the material. Do not bypass, alter, or remove any installed safety device. The exception are porta vans designed to be used with one hand. They are smaller, lighter, and have a limited throat opening. When using a one-handed, the guard on the bottom must be in place. Each employee is responsible for keeping their general work area free of debris. Materials shall be periodically picked up and disposed of in containers in designated areas. Remove all protruding nails found in lumber or bend them over flush with the wood. 
Keep stairways, passageways, and walkways clear of tools, equipment, cables, and other materials at all times. Hoses, cords, and cables are to be positioned overhead whenever possible. Maintain material storage areas in a neat and orderly manner. All materials stored in tiers shall be stacked, racked, blocked, interlocked, or otherwise secured to prevent sliding, falling, or collapse. When storing tools or equipment, material on upper elevations, precautions must be taken to prevent them from falling to a lower elevation. Do not store sharp materials in a location or manner that creates an additional hazard, such as punctures, lacerations, etc. Care must be taken in storing tools, equipment, and personal protective equipment. Protecting against injuries and property damage resulting from dropped objects. Safeguards must be in place to mitigate the possibility of any tool, material, or object from falling to a lower level. Elevated and overhead work safety is crucial. Injury prevention includes pearl weave netting, tethering of tools, using lifting bags, tow boards, barricading off the area below, storing nuts, bolts, washers, etc. in buckets and not left loose on upper decks, and the removal of non-necessary tools, material, and debris so they cannot become a dropped object. A hole is a gap or void two inches or more in its least dimension in a floor, roof, or other walking working surface. All holes must be covered as soon as they are created to protect workers from objects falling below and or to protect workers from stepping into or falling through. Hole covers shall be secured when installed to prevent accidental displacement by wind, equipment, or employees. Hole covers shall be color-coded or shall be marked with the word hole or cover to provide a warning of the hazard. Signs, signals, or barricades are used to warn of potentially hazardous conditions. Do not remove or modify any signs, signals, or barricades unless you are authorized to do so. Yellow caution tape should be used to alert others of potential hazards in the area, for example, tripping hazards or slippery conditions. Red danger tape should be used to warn others of a high hazard area, for example, a suspended load. It may not be crossed by unauthorized individuals unless permission is received to enter. All other barricades, such as radiation hazard or asbestos, can never be crossed without a case-by-case -case authorization. The individual erecting the barricade tape is responsible to maintain and remove the tape when either the work is complete or the hazard is eliminated. A tag shall be installed on all barricade tape, which includes the following information, the date, the nature of the hazards, and the name of the person or contractor who erected the barricade tape. Ladders must be inspected before each use. If anything is found to be wrong with them, they should be red tagged and removed from service. Ladders must be secured to prevent movement. Use wire or rope to secure or have a coworker hold the ladder. Place then a substantial base. Free from broken or missing rungs, steps or broken or split side rails. Place in an area where they will not be displaced by equipment or workers unless protected by barricades. When working from a ladder and exposed to a fall greater than six feet, fall protection must be used. Pay special attention when using a ladder in close proximity to a handrail on upper elevations. Always face the ladder when climbing and use both hands. Always maintain three points of contact. Do not stand or sit on the top two steps or rungs of the ladder. Do not carry tools or equipment when climbing the ladder. Use hand lines or other means to raise and lower tools and equipment. Proper use of the type of ladder you're working with is critical. When using a straight ladder, always make sure there's a 4 to 1 ratio and the ladder extends a minimum of 36 inches or 3 rungs above the landing area. Never use a step ladder as a straight or extension ladder. They must be fully open with the spreader bars locked. The electrical cords should be hung up out of the way and never run where they could pose a trip hazard. Diligence needs to be applied around stairways. When routing electrical cords overhead, secure them with a minimum of 7 foot overhead clearance with non-conductive means such as zip ties or rope. Do not run electrical cords along floors, across walkways or roadways where they could be damaged by traffic. All temporary lighting is required to have light bulb protectors. Whenever routing an electrical cord through an opening, including the side of gang boxes, the cord must be protected from sharp edges. All electrical cords and power tools must be plugged into a GFCI protected outlet. Portable GFCIs shall be inspected before each use by intentionally tripping and resetting it. 
All electrical cords need to be inspected prior to each use for signs of damage to insulating coverings, plugs, and receptacles. All damaged or defective tools and equipment must be red tagged and immediately taken out of service. The use of grounding adapters is not permitted, such as a three-prong plug into a two-prong adapter. A repair on electrical cords, power tools, or other equipment is only allowed by an authorized person. Compressed air shall not be used for personal cleaning purposes. Before disconnecting a pneumatic tool from the air hose, shut off the supply air and bleed the pressure from the line. All Chicago style fittings must be pinned or wired together to prevent them from coming apart under pressure. Whip checks must be used on connections 3 quarter inch or larger. Whips should be elongated along the hose. If a hose is going to be moved or in a position where a valve could be bumped, Oval handled valves are preferred over straight level handles to reduce the possibility of inadvertent actuation of the valve. Hot work includes all welding, cutting, grinding, soldering, brazing, or any other activity which creates a spark. Owner or client hot work permitting and procedures must always be followed. Be familiar with the established fire alarm system and emergency procedures as well as the location of fire extinguishing equipment in your work area. All flammable liquid storage areas shall be separated from working areas and clearly isolated. Maintain good housekeeping in your area, which will eliminate the accumulation of combustible materials. Portable fire extinguishers must be located within 25 feet of all hot work. Fire extinguishers must be equipped with an annual inspection tag from the supplier, fully charged, pin in place, and current on the inspection for the month. No employee is to attempt to suppress a fire beyond the incipient stage. If you happen upon a fire that is small enough for you to actually fight with one of these smaller fire extinguishers, all you have to remember is the acronym PASS. PASS helps us learn how to use this thing safely and not forget it when our mind is being preoccupied by the blaze. P is for pull, and we're going to pull the pin. The pin is here to make sure that this thing doesn't accidentally get discharged. It's really the only thing that's stopping these two levers from coming together and discharging the unit. When we pull the pin, make sure we're not squeezing together. We're just holding on the underside. It should be pretty easy to pull. It should have some sort of a tether on it or maybe a plastic band. Discard both of those things, and that's when we're going to go ahead and grab this nozzle and move on to our next letter. Grab this nozzle, and we're going to aim at the base of the fire. Stay a nice, safe distance away. And S is for squeeze. When we squeeze this handle, we'll discharge the unit. And the last thing we're going to do is sweep. We're going to sweep at the base of the fire and try to put out the flames from the bottom up. If you are assigned as a fire watch, it is your responsibility to understand the location and nature of the hot work, survey the area to make sure the necessary fire protection equipment is in place and ready for use, survey the area for accumulations of combustible or flammable materials, and if possible, remove the materials. Remain in the area while hot work is being performed and remain in constant communication range with personnel doing the hot work. Never leave the area for any reason without being replaced by another fire watch and remain in the area 30 minutes after the completion of the hot work, unless specified otherwise on the hot work permit. When bulkheads or walls are involved in hot work, both sides require a fire watch. Caution must be used so that heat transfer through the steel components or pipes does not create a hazard. Always follow any additional site-specific requirements. Only approved safety cans may be used for storage, handling, and or dispensing of gasoline, diesel fuel, or kerosene. Plastic cans are not allowed. Storage of LP or propane gas inside of buildings is prohibited, unless it is in use. When practical, material to be welded, cut, or heated should be moved to a safe location. When welding or cutting at elevations, Fire blanket or similar means should be used to contain sparks and slag from falling below. Portable fire extinguishers must be located within 25 feet of all hot work activities. The following PPE is required when welding or cutting. Long sleeves, FR or cotton clothing, no polyester or similar synthetic material that can melt, approved gloves, welding hood with appropriate lens, face shield or burning goggles when cutting. Frames on all electrical welding machines shall be properly grounded. All electrode holders in the first 10 feet of welding lead shall be totally free of any defects, splices, or repairs. Remove electrodes from the holder when not in use. 
never place an electrode against a compressed gas cylinder to strike an arc. The electrode holder, when left unattended, shall be placed or protected so that it cannot make electrical contact with employees or conducting objects. All electrode stubs shall be disposed of in a fire-resistant container and not thrown on the floor. Welding screens or similar barriers shall be used to protect others from arc flash. Protect welding cables so they will not be damaged or create a tripping hazard. Whenever possible, route welding leads overhead a minimum of 7 feet. Non-conductive ties such as zip tie or rope must be used to hang or secure welding leads. Do not use wire, welding rod, etc. Keep oil and grease away from oxygen cylinders and fittings since this may cause a fire or explosion. Do not use any hose valves or fittings that appear to be damaged or defective. Before connecting a regulator to a cylinder valve, crack the valve slowly to clear the valve. While acetylene cylinders are in use, the valve key wrench or handle shall be kept in place on the valve spindle. Never use acetylene at a pressure greater than 15 psi. Use friction strikers or other similar means to light torches. Never use matches, lighters, or a lit cigarette. Inspect torches daily for leaking shutoff valves, hose couplings, and tip connections. Never use the torch head as a hammer. Shut off valves and bleed lines on cylinders whenever work is finished. Replace protective valve caps when the cylinder is not in use. Use flashback arrester on all compressed gas and oxygen cylinder gauges. Oxygen shall not be used for ventilation purposes, cooling, or blowing dust off of clothing. Torch hoses shall be removed from confined spaces when not in use. Oxygen cylinders must be stored a minimum of 20 feet from flammable gases unless they are separated by a half hour rated firewall, regardless of whether they are full or empty. Cylinders shall be stored away from any source of heat or electrical contact. Secure all cylinders to prevent tipping. Always store cylinders in an upright position with valve protection caps in place. Cylinders must be stored or used in temperatures under 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Use a bottle cart for transporting compressed gas cylinders. Hoisting cylinders requires the use of a special carrier designed for that purpose. Valves must be removed and protective caps must be in place. As a Jamar employee, you have a right to know the hazards of the chemicals you work with or may come into contact with, protective measures that should be taken, and safe work practices to prevent overexposure. Safety data sheets, or SDSs, provide readily accessible information regarding the characteristics of products that may be on your worksite. The information contained in an SDS is arranged in a universal format under these 16 headings. Safety data sheets, or SDSs, are available by phone, internet, or hard copy. SDSs are readily available to all employees. Jamar utilizes MSDS Online to maintain their safety data sheets. Information on how to access a safety data sheet can be found in your safety handbook or you can ask your supervisor. The globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, or more commonly referred to as GHS, is a system for standardizing and harmonizing the classification and labeling of chemicals. GHS has become the global standard. There are nine pictograms in the GHS labeling scheme, each representing a different hazard. Details of each symbol and what they represent can be found in your handbook. The NFPA diamond labels use a color and numbering system. Blue represents the health hazard, red is for flammability, and yellow is reactivity. The white section is reserved to indicate additional information, such as a specific hazard about the chemical or material. A number rating system of 0 to 4 is provided to rate each of the four hazards. The higher the number, the higher the hazard. For more information, please refer to your handbook or ask your supervisor. You may also encounter an HMIS, or Hazardous Material Identification System, label. It is similar to an NFPA diamond in the hazards it communicates. However, the one big difference is the white section. On the HMIS label, a letter goes in the white section, indicating the personal protective equipment that needs to be worn when handling this chemical. 
Lead poisoning can occur when lead builds up in the body, often over a period of months or years. Even small amounts of lead can cause serious health problems. All painted surfaces shall be considered to contain lead unless identified otherwise. Employees shall not perform any hot work or perform abrasive means on lead painted surfaces. Crystalline silica is a material found abundantly in the Earth's crust, and it occurs in several forms, quartz being the most common. Inhalation of crystalline silica can lead to silicosis, which can be disabling or even fatal. If your work task has the potential for silica exposure, the control methods used to minimize or eliminate exposure will be reviewed with you in your JSA. Until the 1970s, asbestos was the material of choice for insulating pipes and boilers, to strengthening cement or making breaks. Once disturbed, the fibers are rapidly released into the air. Significant exposure to airborne asbestos fibers may increase the risk of lung cancer and other respiratory disease. Common asbestos-containing materials include insulation, gasket materials, asbestos siding, tiles, fireproofing materials, heating and electrical ducts, cement, roofing shingles and felt, caulking, putties, adhesives, and vinyl. Carbon monoxide poisoning is caused by an overexposure to carbon monoxide, a colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas that is a byproduct of incomplete combustion. A few examples of sources that produce carbon monoxide include gas-powered generators, space heaters, motor vehicles, as well as welding and cutting operations. Symptoms of carbon monoxide exposure include headache, dizziness, nausea. If you have any concern about carbon monoxide exposure in your work area, notify your supervisor immediately. For additional information regarding the signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide exposure, please refer to your safety handbook. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S, is a colorless, flammable, extremely hazardous gas with a rotten egg odor. It occurs naturally in crude petroleum and natural gas and can be produced in the breakdown of organic material. H2S is heavier than air, therefore has a tendency to accumulate in low-lying areas. At low concentrations, H2S has a rotten egg odor. However, H2S can paralyze your sense of smell, making you unable to detect the presence of H2S gas at higher concentrations. Hexavalent chromium is a known carcinogen. The primary method of exposure is the inhalation of fumes or dust that have been generated by hot work on stainless steel or material containing chromium. Hexchrome exposure levels will vary significantly based on the type of work you are performing and the type of material involved. Ventilation controls or respiratory protection may be required to minimize exposure levels. If you have any questions about exposure control methods or work practices, ask your supervisor. Exposure to extreme heat can cause illness and death. The most serious heat illness is heat stroke. Other heat illnesses such as heat exhaustion, cramping, and heat rash are possible from exposure to extreme heat. Familiarize yourself with the precautions to avoid heat-related illnesses. More information can be found in your safety handbook. Know the symptoms of cold stress. Reddening of the skin, tingling, pain, swelling, leg cramps. Dress properly. Dress in layers. Wear insulated gloves and boots. Cover your head. Monitor your physical condition and that of your co-workers. Stay dry. Moisture can increase heat loss from the body. Due to the potential exposure to bloodborne pathogens, no employee is required to render first aid or clean up any bodily fluids as a job function. Only trained employees who have volunteered may clean up bodily fluids. Rigging equipment must be inspected prior to each use. Any damage or defective rigging equipment must be removed from service immediately. Working load limit tags are required to be fixed on all chokers and slings. Any rigging equipment that does not have a load capacity identification tag on it must be immediately removed from service. Softeners must be used to protect rigging from corners or sharp edges. Precautions must be taken to ensure workers are not underneath suspended loads. Barricade tape, the use of spotters, or audible alarms are all examples of commonly used methods to prevent workers from being underneath suspended loads. When necessary, use tag lines to control the suspended load. Be aware of potential pinch points with tag lines and always maintain a safe distance away from loads. Only designated, trained, qualified, and where required, licensed personnel shall be allowed to operate any crawler, mobile crane, truck crane, overhead gantry crane, all forklifts, air-operated hoists, electric hoists, and other such lifting equipment. Operators shall accept signals only from the designated signal person. Employees are not permitted to ride on any type of lifting equipment. All accessible areas around a crane superstructure shall be barricaded. There are three types of scaffold takes, green, yellow, and red. 
A green tag designates that the scaffold meets all OSHA regulations and personal fall protection is not needed. A yellow tag designates that the scaffold is incomplete and may require the use of fall protection or other safety precautions. A red tag designates that the scaffold is not safe for use. You must never use a red tagged scaffold. If a scaffold does not have a tag or does not have a documented daily inspection listed, don't use it and you must notify your supervisor. Regardless of the scaffold tag color, you must always read the tag prior to using the scaffold and you must follow the requirements for access and use. An excavation more than four feet deep where the atmosphere may be compromised must be tested before the employees are allowed to enter. All underground utilities will be located prior to trenching or excavation. The excavated spoil pile will be kept a minimum of two feet back from the edge of the trench. Never work under loads being handled by power equipment. All trenches four feet deep or more will have ladders spaced at intervals not to exceed 25 feet for access. When necessary, protective systems will be used to protect workers from cave-ins while working in excavations. Only trained personnel shall operate an aerial lift. Employees must perform a documented pre-use inspection of the aerial lift prior to use. Inspect the work area in which the lift will be operated for hazards. Examples include drop-offs, holes, debris, electrical sources, overhead hazards, other equipment, or other workers. All employees who operate or occupy aerial lifts shall tie off to the manufacturer's anchorage point whenever in the lift. Only trained and authorized personnel are allowed to operate forklifts or mobile equipment. Operators are required to perform a documented pre-use inspection per shift. Seatbelts are required to be worn at all times while operating a forklift. Cell phones shall not be used while operating a forklift. Personnel shall not stand or pass under the elevated portion of any fork truck, whether loaded or empty. Forks must be lowered to the ground when a forklift is parked and left unattended. Personnel shall not ride on fork trucks as passengers. Prior to the demolition of any piping system, a JSA meeting will be conducted which will specify precautions and procedures to follow to safely perform the demolition. Typical precautions that are taken may include but are not limited to lockout tagout, line purging procedures, line breaking permit, atmospheric testing, specialized PPE. Please refer to your Jamar Safety Handbook for information related to steel erection. This concludes the Jamar Company Safety Orientation. As a Jamar Company employee, you're responsible for complying with all of the company policies contained in the Jamar Employee Safety Handbook, as well as any site or job-specific rule or policies. If you have any questions or need clarification on any of these policies or any of the information contained in the safety orientation, please refer to your handbook or ask your supervisor.